Here we're going to focus on uh, chemical bonding. And the learning outcomes are to predict which elements are likely to form ions, explain how molecules are formed from atoms joined by covalent bonds, and contrast polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. So we're going to start with molecules. And molecules are groups of atoms held together in a stable association. A compound or compounds here another term these are going to be molecules containing more than one type that's the key right there so you have more than one type of element uh, atoms are going to be held together in molecules or compounds by chemical bonds so what is a molecule well oxygen for example is never by itself it's always two oxygen atoms combined so it's always written as o2 so here we actually have a molecule of oxygen. Hydrogen is the same, so that's a molecule. But if I put two different types of elements together to form a molecule, we now have a compound. So this would be carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and water. All of these I've drawn here are all molecules, but only the last three are also compounds. So, uh, while all compounds, molecular compounds, are molecules, not all molecules can be compounds. For example, the first two I gave you, they're molecules, but they're not compounds. So we're going to start with ionic bonds, and you need to be familiar with that. And an ionic bond is going to be formed by attraction of op at least oppositely charged ions. So what is an ion anyway? Well, an ion is going to be a charged atom or group of atoms. And I'll just say particles, so charged particles. And there's going to be two kinds. There are cations, which are going to be positively charged, and anions, which are negatively charged. So it would be good to be familiar with those terms in case you see them in questions. So if you have oppositely charged ions, uh, cations and anions, they're going to attract each other, which causes the ionic bond. So here this gives an example of a plain neutral sodium atom uh, reacting with a chloride atom. And this is going to give you, uh, the, so the sodium is going to lose an electron, which we Cause it to become positive and the chloride is going to gain an electron which causes it to become negative and so then the oppositely charged atoms will bind so what i like to do is draw what's called dot structures where we would draw the sodium atom and we're going to draw it with its valence electron it does have inner shell electrons but the outermost shell only has one so everything uh every in fact every element in the same column as sodium will, can be drawn this way and chlorine, if we look at the periodic table, is going to have seven valence electrons, so we're going to draw all seven. We're going to pair up the ones we can, and that's six, and then one lone one by itself. Neither one is going to be stable because we're going to be following the octet rule. And there's something to remember here. Anytime you have a metal, which is on the left side of the periodic table, react with a non-metal, we're going to tend to get ionic bond formation. And the metal's going to have a strong pull on the uh, the non-metal's going to have a strong pull on the metal's valence electron, and so the metals will will lose all of their valence electrons. What's going to happen is this electron is going to come right here into the valence shell of chlorine, and our result is going to be a sodium atom now that has one less electron than normal, so it's off balance because it has one less negative charge. It now has gone from the zero. Uh, charge to a plus one charge. We'll just put a plus there for that. The chloride, the chlorine atom now has gained that extra electron. And because it, it used to be neutral before, it had a charge of zero, and then it gains an extra electron, then it becomes negatively charged. So then we get sodium uh, chloride. So now our compound, uh, the sodium atom, is going to be attracted to the negative, or the sodium cation is going to be attracted to the chloride anion, and so we get the compound sodium chloride, and it's ionic. So um, 
the electrical attraction of water molecules can be dis can disrupt the the bonding between these. So, a lot of times the uh, water can, can dissolve these mo these molecules or these uh, these compounds uh, because water has the ability to do that. We'll see why in the next section. So I, I just found this periodic table and placed it on here just to show you that uh, all of these metals that are right here in the first column can always be drawn dot structure with one dot. So I'm just going to put an X for any one of them. We can write FR, RB, K for potassium, sodium, and put one dot. And it, because they lose them during the reaction with nonmetals, they'll typically form a plus one part. So you can predict that all the time. The second column can always be written with two dots. So you can write Mg with two dots, uh, magnesium, calcium, and so on. And then we can come to the other side of the periodic table where chlorine was right there, fluorine right above it, bromine, all of those can be written just like we did before with those seven valence electrons. And when it gains an extra electron, it become mainly charged. Oxygen, sulfur, they have six valence electrons. They can fit two extra electrons to get that magic uh, eight number octet, uh, following the octet rule, so they become negative two. And then nitrogen uh, here has uh, five valence electrons, so it can fit up to three more, three extra electrons, so it become negative charge. Notice the last column, the noble gases. They typically don't form any charge at all because their valence shell's full, so they don't react well with anything. So this is just a nice chart to summarize. I also want to point out a rule here that we can predict. That anytime we have a metal react with a non-metal on the periodic table of non-metals, we can find if we start right here and then we walk down a staircase right here, Anything to the left we consider metals, and anything to the right non-metals. When they react, we're going to get our result is going to be an ionic bond. Ions will form. Here's another rule we can follow. We're going to cover this next type of bonding uh, next. Anytime we have a non-metal, react with another non-metal. For example, nitrogen and oxygen, we're going to get a sharing of electrons. Instead of losing and gaining electrons, which is what happens between metals and nonmetals, we're going to get a sharing here. And we're going to call that sharing type of bond a covalent bond, which we're going to cover next. Okay, so this is a good general rule to remember, and we'll see why in a bit. So here's just a model. Uh, we modeled this same thing with our dot structures. Here's, well, let's go back there. Here's your full sodium atom right here. And uh, there's its one valence electron. And then here's your chlorine atom. And it's missing one valence. Uh, well, it's not missing. It's got its full set of electrons, but it only has seven valence electrons script and one more. So what happens during the reaction is the sodium loses its valence electron and it goes into the chlorine's valence shell right there, uh, kind of like we represented earlier. And then the result here is going to be a sodium ion, which is missing its valence shell. And notice that the valence shell right underneath there has a total of two, four, six, eight. So while it is missing one uh, valence electron, it does now have an octet. And chlorine, now becoming the chloride ion, has gained its uh, extra electron. So now it also has the magic number eight for its octet. And so we get our sodium ion and our chloride ion and then these ions all attract to each other to form a sodium chloride crystal which you see right there. Next is covalent bonds and covalent bonds are going to form when atoms share two or more valence electrons. So that's the key, the sharing, uh, to share those valence electrons. The result is we're not going to have a net charge and we're also going to bond until we get an octet but by sharing instead of gaining and losing. And another idea here is to have no unpaired electrons. So all the electrons must be paired. If they're not paired, 
then the atom was still going to be reactive. So that's the key there. Uh, the strength of the covalent bond is going to depend on the number of shared uh, electrons. So if we have one pair shared strong, two pair even stronger, and so on. Uh, let's get an idea of what that might uh, look like here. So uh, a lot of your compounds that make up uh, living uh, organisms or biological compounds are going to be composed of two or more atoms, uh, and they may share electrons with two or more, two or more atoms. So basically, the biological compounds, the organic compounds, are 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 formed by covalent bonds. So here we show some of the simplest molecules that can form between hydrogen. Recall that hydrogen has only one valence electron, so I'm drawing it up here at the top. If we get the other hydrogen atom with its one valence electron and put them right in the middle so that they share, then there's going to be a covalent bond. That's represented right here. We typically can just draw the shared electron pair as a dash, and you see that done over here to the left. So this would be the structural formula. This would be the molecular formula, and here's our planetary model or orbit model there. So uh, that's the case there. What about for oxygen? Oxygen, if we do its dot structure with just its valence electrons, it's going to have six valence electrons. And so it's not stable. So with the, you know this way, you never find it by itself. So we have another oxygen atom. It also has two unpaired electrons. So those two can be shared right there, and those two can be shared right there. And the result is two pairs being shared by the valence electron. When that happens, we're going to have two, four, six, eight associated with the one on the left, and then those being shared are also associated with the one on the right. So there we have our four electrons, four, six, eight. So each one is obtained an octet by doing this. And then we can represent it, the double bond with two dashes. So each dash represents a pair of electrons. What's missing in this drawing are the unshared pairs, like the one that's right over here, and the one that's right over here. So sometimes you'll see these structural formulas drawn with the unshared pair of electrons, but the key here is all electrons are paired. If there's any unpaired electrons, it's unstable. So here's our structural formula right here, and here's our molecular formula for oxygen. The same can hold for nitrogen. Nitrogen by itself has five valence electrons, and so right now it has three unpaired electrons, so it can form three covalent bonds, and it can do that with another nitrogen, just like we did with oxygen. The result here is a triple covalent bond with a total of six valence electrons being shared there. That's six on the, uh, for the left being shared and six for the right being shared, and we can, we can count them for both atoms. So six for the left plus those two makes eight. Again, six for the right, the same ones being shared plus the one on the, uh, plus the, those pair of electrons there, that gives us eight for each, so they both follow the octet. If I'm going to draw this uh, structural formula more correctly, I would also represent the unshared pair of electrons. And we can see the structural formula shows eight, two. Each dash is two, two, four, six, and then eight on the outside. And then here is our molecular formula. So the concept of electronegativity comes up here. This is a term to understand. And this has to do with relationships with atoms that are reactive. Uh, as it turns out on the periodic table, the atoms have different pulls on those electrons when they interact with each other, so some pulls more strongly than others. So sometimes it's defined as an affinity for electrons, and guess which ones have the most is the nonmetals. That's why they really pull them away from metals, but uh, also when uh, two atoms that are not of the same element are interacting, they they have different pulls, so one will pull stronger than the other. We're going to see a chart that shows which are the strongest at pulling and which are the weakest at pulling. Okay. So these differences in electronegativity uh, between atoms that are interacting can be the difference between the type of bonds. So there's going to be, uh, and this can explain why we get ionic bonds, is the difference is very great and one is very, very strong at pulling on electrons or has a very high affinity, we're going to get an ionic bond. That's not mentioned here on, on this particular slide, so I'm going to write it in. Uh, if they're equally shared, then the electrons are going to spend equal time between both atoms, and we're going to get a, a type of bond, a covalent called nonpolar. So it's just a category of covalent bonds. And then if one pulls a little more than the other, then we're going to get a polar bond. It's not quite an ionic. 
so one of the atoms is not strong enough to completely pull the electrons off, but the sharing is unequal. So the electrons spend a little more time near one of the atoms. So we get a polar covalent bond. And both here are basically being uh, let's shell electrons uh, shared. So they're, co they're just basically covalent bonds. So um, we're going to go look at those types of bonds just a little more closely in a little bit. But before that, I want to cover chemical reactions. So be able to recognize the basic structure of how we represent a chemical reaction. And a chemical reaction involves the formation and breaking of chemical bonds. So we're going to have a chemical reaction. We're going to break bonds and make new ones. So that new molecules or new compounds are formed from uh, the reactants involved. So the atoms can shift from one molecule to another. Um, and so when you get new products or, or new things being formed, they're going to have different formulas. Uh, so the one thing to remember here is the reactants will be represented as the original with going through the reaction and the products are what you get afterwards. And this arrow that's right here can be read as uh, yields. Okay, so this one right here would be the same six. We have a total of six H2Os, which is water, and six carbon dioxides, the reactants, will react to yield C6H12O6, which is the big glucose and six molecules of O2 or oxygen and those are the products there. So I can give you any reaction you've never seen before and you should be able to tell me what the reactants are and what the products are. Okay. So um, uh, we also we cannot basically destroy or create matter and that includes atoms so we need to have the same number of atoms on each side so the way we do that is uh, the formulas are going to be what they are. Glucose would always have C6H12O6 and oxygen would always have O2. So the way we can make sure we balance and have the right number on each side of the arrow, in other words, we didn't destroy anything, is to put these coefficients in front. And so that's why 6 is put in front. If we now figure out if we have 6 molecules of water, that gives us 12 hydrogens and 6 oxygens there. And uh, all we have is 12 on the left, so that matches with the 12 on the right. So we balance with this. That's more of an exercise for chemistry class. And we could do some practice on that, but we do need to move on. So just be aware that the atoms should be balanced on each side. Now, what can influence a chemical reaction uh, and how it proceeds and progresses? Temperature can be one. Higher temperature faster chemical reaction. This is because the particles are moving faster, so there's more collisions um, that go on. The concentration. If you have more reactants, then uh, that can also speed up the reaction because it's more crowded and there. there's more particles colliding, and so uh, the reactions can influence uh, the reaction taking place. And then whether or not you have a catalyst. The catalyst is going to be uh, basically another substance that doesn't get involved in the reaction but helps speed it up. For example, if I have pure iron, which is Fe, and it's real shiny and I polish it and I just leave it in dry air, over time the iron will react with oxygen and form iron oxide, which is rust. Uh, but it can take a while, especially if it's very dry. But if I were to wet the iron by the next day, you, you can already see rust forming. So the water acts as a catalyst. In your living systems, we have special proteins that uh, serve as catalysts, and they're called enzymes, and we're going to study those later. Uh, a lot of reactions can be reversible, so that says, for example, if we have uh, reactant A react with reactant B, sometimes you see the forward reaction, and we have product AB, but sometimes you'll see reactions represented like this, and this means that the reverse can happen, so we can go from AB and, and we have the opposite going. So we'll see reactions like that in our study of biology. So how can we predict the type of bond? I found this periodic table and if we look at it over here to the right we are missing the noble gases so on the far right we only have up to group 7a or group 17 we're missing 18 of the noble gases. What this periodic table shows you is 
uh, on how the electronegativities compare. So earlier we mentioned electronegativities, which is the affinity that atoms uh, in bonding situations have for electrons. And you see the, the greatest affinity is over here up on the top right, where the fluorine being the greatest, and it's assigned a value of four. Oxygen is pretty high, chlorine, nitrogen. They're all fairly high. Notice we put hydrogen over here. When hydrogen interacts with these nonmetals, it behaves as a nonmetal as well. Uh, so the greater the difference, the greater the affinity is for the nonmetal for those electrons. And so we compare the electronegativities to the electronegativities of metals. They're relatively low. They're so low that the, the metals lose their valence electrons. And those valence electrons go into the valence shells of nonmetals. Uh, but as the differences become uh, closer, as the electronegativities become closer and the difference becomes smaller, then we tend to have a sharing instead of um, uh, having um, uh, a losing and gaining of electrons between the atoms. So we're going to take a look at that here. So the ultimate sharing would create a bond called a nonpolar covalent bond. And the most equal sharing would occur between two atoms of the same kind. So, for example, if we have two hydrogens forming that single bond, covalent bond we saw earlier, those pair, that pair of electrons is going to be equally shared between the two um, atoms because there's well, there, there's not, there's no difference between electronegativities. However, if we were to get a, uh, say, a hydrogen with its one valence electron, and uh, we bond it, bond one of those hydrogens with an oxygen, and oxygen has six valence electrons, so uh, we're going to need actually two hydrogens, but we'll just focus on uh, forming one bond with one of them. So these two can be shared right here, and so we're going to end up with an oxygen and a hydrogen here. And if we compare here, the oxygen is electronegativity of 3.5, but hydrogen is 2.1. So there's a, a good difference between the electronegativities. Oxygen has a greater affinity, so this pair of electrons is going to spend more time closer to the oxygen and the hydrogen. And what that does is it creates an uneven distribution of charge. And so what, what happens there then is that this oxygen, uh, this side of the, of the molecule now, or compound here, uh, or molecule will have a partially negative. It's kind of like standing in a rowboat. You're not right in the middle, you stand off to the side. So there's gonna be more negative charge over here. And on this side, we have more positive charge. Not a full positive, full negative, but uh, the two end up uh, canceling each other out. So overall, the molecule doesn't have a charge to it, but there's a polarity to it, and we're going to call this a dipole because there are two poles there. And so the oxygen side will have greater uh, negative charge. So we we'll say this Greek letter sigma negative for partial negative and then partial positive here. And so what we form now is a polar covalent bond. Now we go if we go back and we consider the case between, say, sodium, which has an electronegativity of 0.9 and chlorine which has an electronegativity of 3.0 those electronegativities when we compare are so great that recall that the sodium loses its valence to the chlorine so that valence electron gets lost to the chlorine which has seven and then it forms ions like we saw earlier okay so uh so basically, whether we have nonpolar covalent or polar covalent bonds depends on how great a difference. The most equal sharing, though, will be between two like atoms like this. Okay. Uh, I want to point out that the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen here is quite small compared uh, compare it to the others. Hydrogen has back here. Hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1 and carbon uh, 2.5. So this is for hydrogen, this is for carbon. The difference is uh, not so great. So the electrons spend pretty much about equal times or so between carbon and hydrogen bonds. They may spend a little bit more time near carbon, but 
Typically, it's not great enough to cause any significant dipole, like we saw for oxygen and hydrogen. So, we essentially would call it most of, almost nonpolar in nature. Now, uh, just because we have a polar bond doesn't mean that we're going to have a an entire molecule that will be that will look like it is. Um, the entire molecule itself will have a partial negative, partial positive side to it. For example, if we were to draw a water molecule and this water molecule had a perfectly linear shape to it, and here's its unshared pair of electrons here. We know from earlier, when we were looking at this over here, that the electrons here are gonna spend more time near the oxygen. Well. The same would be happening for this shared pair over here. They spent more time near this oxygen. And so what we would get here is ba uh, roughly a canceling out. So although this is a polar bond, then this is a polar bond right here. Overall, the molecule will not be, uh, not itself not have partial negative and partial positive because they cancel out. However, we do know from uh, studying the water molecule that the water molecule is actually bent. And because of that, the uneven distribution of charges creates a dipole here and a dipole here and overall this side of the water molecule is going to be partially negative and this side will be partially positive. So overall the entire molecule itself is also polar. So just because you have a polar covalent bond does not make you have a polar molecule. That would be the case if water like I showed you here was linear but it's not. We know it is a bent molecule and that gives it its um, that gives it its polar nature to it. And that's going to be significant. We're going to see that this polar nature gives it properties uh, that we're going to look at next, and makes water very significant in terms of of, of uh, uh, the role it plays in in the processes of life. Now I'm going to give you a quick rule. This is the symmetrical rule for a molecule. Generally. If a molecule is symmetrical, which means you can cut it down uh, several planes and it looks like a mirror image, then you're going to get a nonpolar molecule regardless. If it is asymmetrical, which means you can cut it on a plane and it not look like a mirror image, then you're gonna get overall the molecule you can predict would be polar in nature, like the water molecule we just saw. Well, that should say water molecule up there. And over here, if I were to cut the water molecule this way, it would look like mirror images on both sides, but if I cut it this way here, it is not a mirror image, so overall this gives us a Nonpolar. So I'm going to drop here to the right. If I were to draw a molecule called methane, and carbon has four single electrons that can form four covalent bonds. Right here, I can cut it along several planes and it'll look uh, nonpolar or it'll look symmetrical. So it would be nonpolar, like the rule I gave you uh, below there. However, if I were to remove one of the hydrogens and place a chlorine there and with its unchecked um, electrons. It is now asymmetrical and we can predict that it would be polar. And by the way, since chlorine has, you see over here is on that side where we have some of the strongest electronegativities, we can predict that this side of the, of the molecule would be partially negative and the other side would be partially positive. So overall, this molecule would be polar, but the regular methane up here would be nonpolar. So that, be able to predict that, I'm going to ask you on an exam. Uh, I'll give you some molecules and see if you can tell if they're polar or nonpolar.